Hi, Jana. Hi, Frank. Nice to see you. Nice, to, nice to see you too. It's been a bit of a while since our, our last conversation. Yeah. Um, so th thanks again for doing this. My pleasure. I um, there's so much, so much to talk about, uh, but there are things I I don't really want to address, like the the sham, which was uh, Netanyahu speaking in front of Congress. Uh, for me, it's it feels desperate, and it looks like you know such a desperate move that I don't want to give it any focus. But there's something um, that happened. You know, a few a few days ago now, I think, uh, in China, um, a unity deal between Hamas, Fatah, and twelve other Palestinian groups, uh, called an interim national reconciliation government, um, about man maintaining Palestinian control over Gaza. Yes. I was wondering what what uh, if you if you knew mo in a way more about it and what it meant in. Uh, in concrete terms, and is it for you kind of an important development? You know, look, Frank, it can be important. Um, I want to step back for a second. If before Israel's attack on, on Gaza, before the attack on Gaza, before this latest round of genocide, because there's been genocide going on for quite some time, um, if you had polled Palestinians, they would say that the number one issue for them was reconciliation, that this was the, the thing that they wanted to see the most. And this wasn't just in one poll, it was in several polls. So Palestinians want to see reconciliation between the Palestinian factions. And I think it's important to also keep in mind that there isn't a single Palestinian faction that says, yes, Israel is good, and yes, we want to maintain the occupation. And no, there is no right of return. And no, and yes, we want to see most, more settlements. Nobody says that. So the, so the issues of reconciliation are a lot closer than, than, than we think that, that they are. And so based on um, the fact that the issues are closer and based on the fact that this is the really one of the number one, um, this is the number one, excuse me, uh, requests on the part of Palestinians, it's not at all surprising that, um, that we've had a number of reconciliation talks. The problem, of course, is the, the why it is that they failed. This is, I believe, the eighth agreement that has been signed. I hope this one sticks, um, which I'll talk about in just a second. But the reason that the other agreements failed was precisely because they weren't getting into the issues that I just mentioned, but were instead getting into issues of governance. And in particular, the person who made them fail was Mahmoud Abbas, because he doesn't want to see reconciliation. Um, so the problem, Frank, isn't the issues of reconciliation. The problem is why these previous agreements failed. And the reason that they failed is because Mahmoud Abbas just didn't want to see them succeed. Why? Because reconciliation is a threat to his one-man rule. And reconciliation will make him largely irrelevant. And so that's why he's afraid of it. Now, at the same time, there's also been a lot of pressure brought to bear on him by Europe, Western Europe, by the United States and others, but primarily the United States and Western Europe. And so the combination of him not wanting it plus the external pressure has meant that none of these agreements last. Will this one be different? Remains to be seen. What's interesting about this agreement is that they're very clear in spelling out that, that they have to have a vision for Gaza. They're very clear in spelling out that, uh, that they have to work on the ICJ and the aftermath of the ICJ. And they're very clear in saying that Palestinians have a right to resist. And so all of these things combined um, are greater points of unity than they are of division. And I think that there's a, they, that all of the factions recognize, as they did in the past, but particularly in this moment, that unless there is Palestinian unity, then um, it's going to be the situation in which the Americans impose whatever it is that Israel wants to be imposed on us. 
And um, if I understand correctly, this agreement so far is only about Gaza, right? It's not about the, the you know, West Bank, East Jerusalem. No, it's about all of it. It's about all of ah, it. Okay. It's about creating a government that's going to deal with all of the, with, with uh, government for all Palestinians. It's not just about Gaza. And that's the important part is that, is that the vision is, is greater. And what they're doing is that they're also talking about the future, which is, you know, so much of, of, uh, uh, what I fear, Frank, is not the who is going to come next, although I do fear that as well. But it's the what is going to come next, because Abu Mazen has blocked all efforts at elections. He's blocked all, eff all efforts of pluralism, of political pluralism. And, uh, and so I worry about what's going to come next. I, I genuinely do. He's, he's 88, uh, can't last forever, and is behaving as though he will last forever. Um, I'm more afraid of the legacy that he's going to leave behind. And what about the fact that you, we've heard many times oh, over since October the 7th that from the US, uh, from some of uh, European states, that Hamas, following October the 7th, there's no way Hamas will, be, will ever be part of a Palestinian government. Yeah. And this, in a way, shows that it's not going to work. Hamas will yeah. have to be part. Yeah. Of course not. And, you know, Frank, there's, there's such like arrogance to this position. I, you know, just last week, one day before the ICJ ruling came out, the Israeli Knesset passed a vote saying that there will never be a Palestinian state. Who, who voted in favor of the never being a Palestinian state? The, obvi the obvious, the Ben Gvirs, the Smotriches, you know, the Jewish Power Party, which is a... a a party that, that takes its inspiration from a, a Jewish terrorism party. Um, the religious Zionism party, Smotrich, which is, again, a person who has been involved and so deeply involved in the settler movement and in the funding of NGOs. Um, but then it goes even deeper. It goes into Likud. It goes into um, Gantz, the person that people were talking about being the new hope, the new leader. He voted against a Palestinian state. And then you had people who squirreled away and left this, the session, such as Yair Lapid, right? So if anything, these are the people that shouldn't be involved in anything to do with leading anything, because it's clear that they don't believe in, a Pal in Palestinian freedom. It's clear that all that they want to see is Israel continuing its, um, its military control. So if anybody should be excluded, it's them. And yet... You would never see the same arrogance uh, used towards them as is used towards Palestinians and say somehow Hamas should be excluded. It's our decision to make. It, this is the essence of self-determination and it's for Palestinians to choose and decide. It's not, it's not for Israel or anybody else for that matter to choose or decide. Um, ge geopolitically, something very important happened as well. I mean, these unity talks... Um, kind of tend to happen in Qatar and stuff like that, you know, in countries like that. But this time it was in China. So what, what does it say um, about, you know, the world that these talks happened in China? It says a lot. You know, China's been getting much more involved, um, as you saw when it came to Iran, Saudi Arabia. But also it shows the, the complete and utter failure on the part of Western governments to put forward their agenda. Again, as you said, this, this, wasn't, this isn't Algeria, this isn't Qatar, this, and this is certainly not Europe. This is Beijing, and this is um, China stepping in where the, where the world has placed all of these conditions on Palestinians. And, and will it succeed? I don't know. I, I really have no idea because I do think that there'll be an attempt on the part of Abu Mazen to undermine but I think just the mere idea that, that China is getting involved and the fact that they recognize that, um, and the fact that they recognize that there has been a failure on the part of the, um, uh, the Europe and the United States is, is quite indicative. I mean, in the last few months, really, we've, we've seen sort of, you know, something we could call the start of the end 
of US hegemony, right? With South Africa going to the ICJ and we know how, you know, the pressures they, they were, you know, they, they faced not to do it. Uh, now you've got China saying, hey, we're not going to wait for you, the so-called honest broker, to do anything. We'll, we'll do it. Do you think, the, you know, do, do you think this shift that we might be feeling could be, in a way, is positive for the Palestinian people? It is. It is. This is no longer, you know, uh, Frank, it's important to step back. In the, in the, before the signing of Oslo, which disastrously happened 31 years ago, um, this September, Palestinians were not looking to the United States. They weren't looking to Europe because they knew what the position was. These are countries and regions that um, support colonization, that have funded Israel, that have given Israel weapons. Um, and so this is a this is a recalibration back to the to the natural allies such as South Africa. It's I don't think it's at all coincidental that it was South Africa that brought the case before the ICJ. They're using the very tools that have been the very colonial tools that have been employed um, against them, and they're they're bringing it and saying this also applies to you as well. In the case of of China and what's happening uh, and the reconciliation talks that have happened there, again, not surprising because the U.S. spent so much energy trying to oust everybody else, claiming that it was, you know, in this fal very false way that Israel does, um, uh, claiming it's something that it's not, and uh, claim that it was the honest broker. And there's nothing honest about it, and it's certainly not doing any brokering. So this is, this is definitely a shift away. And I really hope that it's, it's followed through by being a complete shift away because, um, because there has not been this groundswell of support coming from, from Western capitals. This isn't to say not from the people, but from Western capitals, we've seen that these are the countries that, that stepped up and continue to, and, continue, and before and even now, continue to give Israel cover for committing genocide. Talking about the U.S., um, Genocide Joe is not going to be the next U.S. president. No. I think it was pretty obvious to a lot of people that he wasn't going to be the next U.S. president, even if he stayed on, on the race. Um, I was wondering what's your, what's your feeling about this? Um, was he, I mean, he was definitely pushed out. He didn't yes. make this his, you know, it wasn't his decision. Was it solely because of his age and, 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 his, and his, you know, pro or was it also because of the genocide, you think, in Israel, in, in Israel, like, sorry, in Gaza? You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not an American, so I, I'm, I sometimes feel I'm the wrong person to, to speak. But because I'm not American, I feel like I can speak because I can step back and, and analyze. One of the things that I, as somebody who watches from afar, have witnessed for my entire life, is that every four years, each of the parties have to create a new hope, right? That's the way that the system works. You have to create a new hope, and then after you create a new hope, then you convince the people that there's the lesser of the two evils, and you vote for the lesser of the two evils. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. That's the way the system works. With genocide Joe Biden, there was no hope that could be created. And the question wasn't just about his age, it was about his policies as well when it came to Gaza. When you look at the number of people who, who uh, signed on to the uncommitted movement, when you look at the, the polling and the number of Democrats who are deeply unhappy with the fact that, um, that, that Joe Biden is, is funding, supporting, cheerleading um, genocide, there was no way that they could create that new hope in, in Joe Biden. And, and so they couldn't then tend to the lesser of the two evils because the only way that the system works is you have new hope and then you have the lesser of the two evils. Well, in this case, there is no lesser of the two evils. So now they have a new hope and that new hope is Kamala Harris. Is she truly a new hope? No, because she has stood in lockstep with, um, with Joe Biden. She, uh, yes, she's made the occasional statement here and there. But again, that's the way that the system works is that 
it, it show, they try to create a, a system in which they show you that there's some level of dissent, but when it really comes to policy, I don't see that there's any fundamental change or anything that's different when it comes to the difference between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. She might act as though she has a lot more empathy um, than Joe Biden, but, but on substance, when it comes to arming Israel, when it comes to cheerleading Israel, when it comes to diplomatically supporting Israel, um, she's going to be in lockstep with Joe Biden's, uh, with Joe Biden. So yeah, you, 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 do, you do not think in any way that she might actually push back on and, and tell Netanyahu, you've got to stop this. The only thing that I think will, will, can potentially change is the fact that they're seeing that um, the polling is showing that younger uh, voters, um, people of color, people of conscience want to see an end to the genocide. And that might push her to, to, uh, to somehow be, quote unquote, tougher. But will, will there be a fundamental sea change as in her own conscience saying that there has to be an end? I don't think so. One thing that has become clear for as much as uh, Netanyahu had this uh, really rather disgusting speech before uh, Congress yesterday, one of the things that became clear if you, if you cut through his speech was a few things. One, he was very much defying Biden and saying to Biden, see, you told me not to go to Rafah, and I did it anyway. Uh, number two is that he was boosting up Trump and saying, thank you, Trump. I know you're going to be the next president. You're going to be there holding my back when, um, when I need it. And three, and this part is very important, is that he made it clear that Israel cannot, quote, do it alone. Israel needs to run to uh, America. It needs to run to Britain. It needs to run to all of these other allies in order to um, be able to, you know, do finish the job as they would as they would call it. Thanks, Diana. I, I want to wrap up with um, a, a bit of a talk about the ICJ. Yes, I had a long conversation about it with Daniel, Daniel Makova, yes. but. Uh, yes. <laughs> But I'd, I'd love to have your, your insight as well, because I also feel it's, it's a, it's a, it, it could be, I mean, it is a game changer, but you see, as usual, and it includes the ICC, um, you know, for the arrest warrants, you see now that the UK is trying to kind of delay the process of the ICC. Germany, apparently, is going to also try to delay the process with kind of bogus claims and stuff and 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 but the icj one in a way how how crucial how important it is even if it's only for us for the movement but also and then it's, it's kind of my follow-up question what else can we can we do because in a way we keep saying like the law is on the side of the palestinian people it is. It's so clear now. You've got the ICJ ruling in January. You've got the ICJ now. You've got the ICC. So it looks like, in a way, the legal experts, the jurists, have, have done their part. But now, what is left to do to actually stop this genocide? Yeah. So, yeah, it's like two questions into one. So there's a few things. You know, the, um, it was really interesting to read the submissions by by Israel's allies to the ICJ. And in those submissions, there were some that said this, you know, the ICC shouldn't, the ICJ shouldn't hear the case. But the overwhelming position that these countries took was that we have a political process and we think that, that there should be a political process. In other words, law doesn't matter. What matters is the political process. And what the ICJ came out and said is, it doesn't matter that there's a political process you need to actually follow law. And that's why it made clear that there is a legal basis for everything. The settlements are illegal. The settlers shouldn't be there. The occupation must be ended. Countries have to do everything to make sure that, that this situation is not, um, is not normalized. And so our work now, now our work begins, which is to say now we, start, we have to start pushing for the governments to 
say, to say exactly how it is that their foreign policy is falling in line with the ICJ. And it's going to force them to, to make a determination as to whether they're going to follow the ICJ or whether they're not. And so simple things like, are you in, in trade with, with the settlements? Not just are you labeling the settlement goods, but are you in trade with the settlements, with the settlement products? What are you doing when it comes to companies? What are you doing when it comes to, um, to dealing with Israeli ministers who are themselves settlers? What are you doing when it comes to, uh, to political prisoners? Like, all of these things, do you believe that, that the ICJ, that your foreign policy should be following the ICJ? And so there's so much work that needs to be done now that we have this ruling. And, you know, from, it's in, uh, in 2004, we had the ruling on the ICJ when it came to the wall. One of the big mistakes that was made was that the PA um, did not follow up with it. And it really let Israel get away with doing whatever it wanted to do. And now we have yet another ruling. And here is where, tying it back to that unity uh, agreement, here's where it's so important that all of our, or that some of our attention be focused on, on trying to push these, um, these capitals and these states to make sure that their policies are in line with the ICJ decision and not let it devolve back into politics over law. So there's a lot of work to be done, and we need to be focused on making sure that that ICJ uh, opinion stands and that Israel isn't allowed to get away with all of these decades of harm. You know, one of the things that struck me um, from in, in hearing the, the president of the court read the decision um, is just the, it, it, it struck me how much we as Palestinians and, and Palestinian, Palestine activists have been gaslit for all of these years where we're kind of told that there is no harm, where we're made to believe that it's all in our heads, where we're sort of like, oh, it's really a conflict or a dispute, it's not an occupation, where we're told that there's not really legality, illegality, where there's kind of a, as they put it, both sides. And it struck me just how much um, we've been gaslit and how, how much work we can now do to make sure that, that we hold these governments to account for the positions that they've taken all these years and for the, and for the decades of gaslighting. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the sort of easiest example to take is the apartheid analogy. Yeah. You know. Now we've got the human rights organizations, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Beth Salem, but we also have the international, you know, the highest judicial body in the world telling us you've been right for 10 years, for 15 years by saying it's apartheid. Yeah. And also, you know, people keep coming back to, if only you had a Palestinian Mandela or Palestinian Gandhi saying, you know, the bloc is actually the negotiations, but the ICJ is saying, to hell with the negotiations. The yeah. occupation needs to end first, and then let's see what happens. Exactly. So it's, it's so yeah. important. And, you know, from uh, this, um, this, is, this was the position that we took during the period of negotiations. And... And it was Israel that, want that, and with the United States, that kept saying, no, no, engage in land swaps, start talking about land swaps, start talking about um, uh, parts of East Jerusalem going to Palestinians and parts of East Jerusalem going to the Israelis. Like, these were all Israeli lines and, and that were pushed through by, by, uh, by the United States. Again, I'm not, this isn't being a champion for the negotiations because they were disastrous in so many ways. But the, the point of the matter is, is that for decades, it was Palestinians who were saying this is illegal. And for decades, we were told, it's okay that it's illegal. You're just going to have to negotiate with your occupier and oppressor. It's akin to saying that somebody who's a victim of abuse has to negotiate with their abuser. And instead, we have to recognize that abuse must stop and that there isn't a, a system of like negotiations with your abuser. It just must stop. And it's up to the world to stop it. Once again, shukran Diana. And shukran Frank, shukran. Thank Thanks you. Thanks again. Thank you.